Um, our next speaker is Lela El Asri from Microsoft Research Montreal. Um, Lela uh, Lela has done a lot of uh, interesting work uh, in natural language dialogue systems, and uh, in her uh, in vision and language space, her recent work focuses on image generation uh, from multi run dialogue and incorporating audio and visual modalities in uh, multi run question answering. Let's welcome Lela on the stage. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to speak at this workshop. Um, so I'm kind of in between two affiliations right now. I was at Microsoft, but I just left Microsoft and I'm going to join Borealis AI in a few weeks. Uh, but the work I'm presenting here was done at Microsoft Research in Montreal with my colleagues Adam Trishler and Jeff Gordon. So. Um, the visual dialogue task is a task that I've been interested in very recently. I come from the dialogue world, and I worked a lot on task-oriented dialogue systems. And in this case, you have a dialogue systems a system that talks to a user and has access to a database, and the dialogue system tries to get information from the user to then uh, get information in the database and then present it to the user. So I like the visual dialogue task like this one, for instance, which is Guess What, which is a data set that was proposed by University of Montreal in 2017 here at CVPR, uh, because it's very resemblant to the task-oriented dialogue system case. Uh, here, essentially, you have two participants. They see the same image. One, has, one sees one of the objects in the image highlighted, and then the other needs to ask yes-no questions to guess which object is highlighted. So here it's the, the human in the foreground. And it's very resemblant to the classical task-oriented dialogue system uh, case because here, essentially, your database is an image. And you have your dialogue system asking questions to the user to get information in the database. And it's simpler in a way because um, an image is just easier to integrate into a fully end-to-end -end differentiable um, architecture. So that's, that's kind of how I got interested in this uh, topic in the first place. And in the original Guess What paper, uh, the, the authors proposed kind of decoupling the problem of visual dialogue into different modules. The first module is your dialogue system. This is this, um, can I use my mouse? Okay, no. So this is the, the dialogue system that looks at the image by getting VGG features. It looks at dialogue history. So here, is it a vase? Yes. And then, uh, is it partially visible? No. And then outputs the next question. Is it in the left corner? So this is your dialogue system. You train it as uh, an encoder-decoder model uh, by giving it as input dialogue history and the image representation. Um, and then you can train what looks like a user simulator. So this user simulator will give answers to your dialogue system. And here it simply gets information about the object to guess. It gets spatial information, the object category, uh, and the image itself. And then it answers the questions of the dialogue system, yes, no, or not applicable. And finally, you can train another model that will tell you about the quality of your dialogue. This model is the guesser. It will read the dialogue, look at the image, and then try to guess the right object. So if your dialogue was good, if your dialogue system did well, ask the right questions, the guesser should be able to guess. If not, the guesser will not be able to guess. So essentially, you kind of have the same structure, dialogue system, user simulator, and uh, estimator of task completion. Um, and if you look at the research in visual dialogue, it kind of follows these different, uh, different modules. There's a lot of research in dialogue modeling itself, research in VQA and uh, understanding images. And then there's research that kind of applies everywhere, which is about how do, you how do you fuse the two modalities? You have images, you have language. Here in these models, they kind of just concatenate everything, but you can use different mechanisms to fuse the two uh, modalities into one model. And the work that I'm going to present today is really about dialogue modeling itself. And it was inspired a lot by experiments that we did in visual dialogue. Uh, but the work that I'm going to present is purely about dialogue modeling, not in the visual setting, but it applies everywhere, including in the visual setting. And I'll, I'll kind of loop, loop back to it at the end. Um, so if you look at 
training those dialogue models, the pipeline looks like this most of the time. Uh, so you have your encoder decoder model and you start by training it with the maximum likelihood objective. So you train it to imitate what's in the training data. And you do this with teacher forcing most of the time. So that means that your decoder that decodes the sentence word by word always gets the ground truth input and then just learns to output the next word and then get the ground truth sequence, output the next word. So it kind of learns to output the, the question word by word. And this is good, but this induces what we call an exposure bias. Uh, so this is a known problem in imitation learning. If you have sequences uh, from an expert, so here from human beings generating your data set, and you only learn to output those sequences one step at a time, um, you don't learn from your own mistakes because you only learn based on the sequences of the expert and you only learn about the next step. So if you're at inference time, if your model starts outputting a word that is not the ground truth word, it gets into uncharted territory basically and it doesn't know how to recover from this. So then what uh, people have started doing is correcting this by using policy gradients training. So essentially what you do is, so you've learned to imitate the expert as, as well as you can, and then you let your decoder, your, your, your whole model decode utterances and you give it feedback on the, those utterances that it decodes. So that's, uh, that's similar to reinforcement learning. Essentially, you output a sequence of words, so that's your actions, and then you get feedback at the end, that's your reward, and then you backpropagate this feedback throughout your, your model. And you can do this either at the sentence level or at the dialogue level. If you do this at the sentence level, that means you get feedback for each sentence that you uh, decode. And that might not always be possible because, for instance, in Guess What, you can't get a reward after each question. You need to read the entire dialogue to see if you're able to guess. You can't say after each question, am I able to guess or not? Because this is just how the data set was built. Um, so that's not always possible. And then at the dialogue level, that's harder because then you only get a reward at the end. And that means you need to output a lot of words, a lot of actions before you see a reward. That could be 30, 40 words that you need to output before you see a reward. And that uh, the, those kind of sparse reward settings in reinforcement learning are known to make the problem much more difficult uh, because reinforcement learning algorithms are really not sample efficient when your reward is that sparse. And that also requires uh, generating dialogues. And so you need a simulator, uh, a user simulator. And um, you know, user simulators are getting better. VQA models in this case are getting better, but that still kind of brings noise to your pipeline. So the work that I'm going to present was really meant to focus on the first part. We wanted to avoid uh, fine tuning with reinforcement learning. We wanted to avoid having to build a user simulator uh, or just you know, focusing on tasks where you can have a sentence level reward. And we focused on one phenomenon in particular, and I'm really gonna uh, kind of dig very deeply into this phenomenon, uh, which is state aliasing. So I know that I've been speaking about uh, improving things in maximum likelihood, but state aliasing is easier to characterize in the RL setting, and it also happens in the RL setting, so I'm gonna start with that just to kind of explain the, the phenomenon and make it clear. Uh, and I'm gonna start with a very simple example and then build my way up. So uh, start with a very simple RL example, then go to the dialogue case, and then go to the maximum likelihood case. And then I'll, at the end, I'll hint on a solution that we've proposed very recently for this problem. Um, I won't have enough time to go very deeply into it, but I'll, I'll just kind of explain the, the principle. So to characterize the problem of state aliasing, I like to use this example that was proposed by Andrew McCallum in his PhD thesis in 1995. Very, very simple RL examples. You only have three states, X1, X2, and X3. And now let's say you put an agent in this ma maze and it always states, starts in X3 and it always faces south. And it only needs to make a decision when it's facing one of those T-shaped interactions in X3, X1, or X2. And uh, so your transition uh, dynamics looks like the, this table here uh, on the bottom left. And so in X3, if you go right, so you're facing south, if you go right, you go all the way to X1. If you go left, you go to X2. In X1, you're facing north. If you go uh, left, you miraculously appear back in X3. And if you go right, 
you go through all the maze back to X3 because you only need to make a choice when you're facing the T-shaped uh, intersection. You don't need to, you, you just go back to X3. You don't need to make a choice in X2. So this is a transition dynamics. This is the reward function. This is a completely made up example, um, but it's completely characterized. So what you can do is you can compute the exact Q values for this problem by using something like dynamic programming. And these Q values tell you uh, at each step for each action, what expected sum of rewards you can expect. So in X1, if you go right, you can expect to have a sum of reward of 1.64, so you should really go right, because when you go left, the rewards are, are much lower. And in X2, you should go right as well, and in X3, you should go left. So what, that's your optimal policy at each state, which is the action that will yield the, the highest sum of rewards. And that's, that's the, the bottom um, table. So now, okay, this is the problem. Now imagine that your agent doesn't have access to the state. It only has access to whether it is facing south or north. In this case, what happens is that x1 and x2 become one state. They're aliased into one state because in, in, in both cases, the agent is facing north. And that's the only information that it has about the state. And x3, it's uh, different because in x3, it's facing south. And so what happens in this setting is, so you, you still have all the information that you need to compute the Q uh, values. And what happens here is that the rewards from X2 and X1 are essentially averaged out uh, by the agent because it doesn't see them separately. It just sees them as one state. Um, and what happens if you compute the optimal policy here at the bottom table is that you don't learn the optimal policy anymore. In X3, which is for the agent, the facing south uh, state, you learn to go right. And in X1 and X2, you learn the right action, but in X3, in X3 you, you don't learn the right action because your perception of the states does not allow you to learn the right action. So what was the point here? Why did Andrew McCollum propose this? So if you look at the original optimal policy, which is the table here, X1 and X2, they share the same optimal action, which is going right. X3 has a different optimal action. And in reinforcement learning in general, you don't have access to the state. You build your own state representation. So you might be tempted to say, oh, okay, if states share the same optimal actions, I, maybe I can group them together. And so I can group X1 and X2 because in, in both cases, I need to do the same thing. I need to, to go right. And X3 is its own state because it's the only one where I need to go left. And the point that Andrew McCollum wanted to make was this example was to say, if you do that, you might not be able to retrieve the optimal policy. So this is not a good way to represent your states. And so what's the link to dialogue modeling, right? Uh, this is kind of here, the, 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 the sentence in blue, building representation based on actions, is kind of what we do when we build end-to-end -end dialogue models. Because if you remember correctly, our models are encoder-decoder models. So we build the representations of the encoder based on the utterances that the decoder need to output. And so we only look at the next action, basically. We only look at the next utterance. And so we're kind of doing this as well. We're building our representations based on the next action. And so the question that we wanted to ask in this work was, could this be that because we learned our representations this way, could it be that state aliasing occur occurs during training? And what are the consequences of this? Um, and so we started as a kind of a proof of concept. We started by just looking at this simple maze. And we ran experiments with this simple maze on only episodes of length two. Start in X3, take one action that goes either to X1 or X2, come back to X3. Episodes of length two, and we ran different architectures. And these are the results. Um, so we ran experiments with LSTMs and GRUs and with policy gradient methods and with value-based methods. So policy gradient method is reinforced, value-based is DQN, and then with different exploration uh, methods. And we counted the number of failures over 50 runs. And what you can take away from this table is that if you just look at the LSTM and GRU line with reinforced and with no exploration, the number of failure is quite high you get 14, between 10 and 17 uh, failures in this case. Then when you add exploration with entropy-based exploration, for instance, it, the number of failures get much lower. And so we thought, okay, so 
uh, could this be that this is due to state aliasing? And so we looked at value-based methods because value-based methods don't learn a state representation based on the next action. They learn based on the value of the next action. So if you learn, if you use a value-based method, you can't alias states together because otherwise you can't predict the right values. And so what happens is that in, indeed DQN suffered much, much less from this and uh, only had about two to five failures out of 50. And so to see if state aliasing was really happening, we looked at the hidden states. And here it's very simple. We had, a, I think, a three-dimensional hidden state uh, for our RNNs, so we could just look at them. And this is what you see uh, here on my right. Um, so the, the, on the left of these plots, what you see is the Euclidean distance between two hidden states. The hidden state after visiting x3 and x1, the hidden state after visiting x3 and x2. If x1 and x2 are alias, this hidden state should be close. And then on the right, uh, you see the probability of taking the optimal action at the beginning. And what you can see here is that those two quantities, the Euclidean distance between the hidden, the hidden states and the probability of choosing the right actions, are very linked, are very tightly linked. Uh, on, the, on the top, that's an example of failure. On the bottom, that's an example of success. In the example of failure, you can't see very much, but what happens is that the, dis the Euclidean distance between the hidden states goes to zero very, very quickly during training, never recovers, and the probability of taking the right action goes to zero and the, the, the agent never recovers from that. And what you see in the bottom is that here, that was an example with exploration. When there was enough exploration, at some point the agent realized that the two states should be different and you can see that the Euclidean distance between the hidden states goes up and exactly at that moment when it goes up, the agent learns to take the right action. So that confirmed that RNNs Trained with policy gradient methods are, um, are subject to state aliasing. And so to confirm that it was due to the fact that X1 and X2 shared the same optimal action, we also ran another experiment where we inverted the rewards for X1 so that the optimal action in X1 was not the same anymore. And what happened is the number of failures in this case was uh, between zero and four for 50 runs for the LSTM and GRU without any exploration, uh, without any, any trick. So that, that really uh, kind of um, converted our uh, hypothesis that state aliasing happens because two states share the same optimal action uh, and happens with policy gradient methods. And then we ran another experiment with the same maze, but uh, because in dialogue, we wanted to get closer and closer to dialogue. In dialogue, you don't output just one action. You output several words to make a sequence. So what happens when you need to output a sequence of tokens? And here we only worked with sequences of lengths two. So here the agent now needs to output two actions to get to the next state, either right, 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 left, 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 or left, right. And we uh, defined three different reward functions. With R1, the optimal action for X1 and X2 are totally different. In X1, it's left, 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 right. In X2, it's right, 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 left. With R2, the optimal action for X1 and X2 are exactly the same. Right, 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 left. And with R3, the optimal action for X1 and X2 only share the first token. In X1, it's right, right. And in X2, it's right, left. And then you, get, you can see the number of failures in the table over there uh, for the different reward functions. And so with R1, when the actions are totally different, not a lot of failures. With R2, when the actions are exactly the same, again, we saw a lot of failures. And what was interesting here was that with R3, where the action only is the same uh, on the first token, but not on the second token, we still had a lot of failures. And then if you look at the plot here, this is, again, the Euclidean distance between the hidden states after visiting X1 and after visiting X2. It went, again, the failure cases that we saw where R3 were due to state aliasing, that this Euclidean distance went down to close to zero and never really went up. And so this is important because in dialogue, you don't always have the same sentence repeated, but a lot of sentences start the same way, especially in guess what? They, they always start like, is it? The man, is it the ball, is it on the right? So if you have state aliasing, when you only share the first same tokens, that could be a real problem in dialogue.
So now let's move on to a dialogue task. And to set up this dialogue task, we use this framework called Text World, which is a framework that was created and released by my colleagues at MSR Montreal uh, in uh, 2018. And what this framework allows you to do is create text-based games, like those old text-based games we used to play uh, in the 80s, I think. Um, and they, they look like this. So you have an environment, and then you can output, you can input actions like take sandwich, and then you get feedback from this environment. And so essentially, you kind of have a dialogue between the player and the environment. So that, that's useful to study dialogue case uh, tasks as well. And so to create a task with text world, you just need to give it the layout. So here, this is the layout that I created. You have two rooms, a bathroom and a bedroom. Uh, they're linked by a corridor. The bathroom is to the west. In the bathroom, there's a blue key. In the bedroom, there's a blue chest. In the chest, there is a red key and a bottle of shampoo. And the chest of the bathroom is empty. So you just need to say to, to give it that, and then it kind of just generates the games for you. And uh, then you need to also specify a quest. So what does the agent need to do to, to win the game? And here, this is the quest that I specified. You start in the bedroom, you need to go to the bathroom, take the blue key, unlock the blue chest, take what's in it, go back to the bathroom, and put the bottle of shampoo in the red chest. Um, so that, that's the quest right here. That, that's all the actions that the agent needs to take. And if you want to see what the dialogue actually looks like, so this is all this text here. Uh, so you have, yeah, the, the input from the, inf the, the environment and then the input from the agent is in bold. And so I designed these dialogues with uh, the idea to study state aliasing. So what I did is that I put the same optimal action twice, which is going west. You need to go west at the beginning and then uh, again you need to go west once you have taken the content of the blue chest. So you need to go west with, for two different states. The first state here is just the first input from the environment, and then the second state is all the dialogue history up to the second time when you need to go west. And so I wanted to see, okay, if I train a, a model like this uh, based on RNNs, will I have state aliasing? And so this is the model that we train for that. Uh, this is a retrieval-based model. So here, basically, we just give the observations from the environment, and the quest, so this is not the list of actions, this is kind of a textual form of the list of actions that text world returns. Uh, we encode all of this, we have another LSTM that kind of runs over all dialogue history to give you dialogue context, so this is your state. And then we have, we give to the model a list of actions and we ask it to find the optimal action uh, from this list. So this is the, the model that we trained with policy gradient methods. And so this, these are the training objectives. So basically, uh, the first one is just uh, it's the, for the, the baseline function, so try to estimate the, uh, the rewards. The second one is entropy-based exploration, and the, the third one is just the uh, reinforced training objective. And then we just kind of um, uh, combine these training objectives with different uh, coefficients, lambda e and lambda v. So this is just a, a, a linear interpolation of all these uh, uh, objectives. So basically when lambda e is zero, that means there's no exploration. When lambda v is zero, that means there's no baseline estimation. And what happens is we have, so we ran 50 runs again, and we show the number of failures again. So three failures when we use both, entropy, exploration, and uh, baseline. 45 failures when we don't use any exploration, and 22 failures when we only use exploration. And so is there state aliasing? Yes, the answer is yes. So here, what I'm showing is in orange, again, the Euclidean distance between the two states preceding going west. So the state at the beginning and then the state after, uh, before going west for the second time. This is the orange value. And then in blue, what I'm showing is the probability of choosing the right uh, last action. So the right last action should be inserting the bottle of shampoo in the red chest. But that's not what the agent does. And what we saw during training was that when the two states of going west became alias because the, the, the hidden states became more or less the same or very close, the probability of taking uh, a wrong action at the end was going towards one. And the, this action is not any action, it was going east. And if you look at the, at the game here, so after going west, 
the agent needs to go east uh, two steps after for the first time. Go west, take the blue key, go east. And then after the second time it goes west, at the end of the dialogue, it needs to do a new action that it has never seen, which is inserting the bottle of shampoo into the red chest. But what we saw during our training was that the agent never did that. It just thought of going east, because going east was a possibility. It was in the bathroom, and so you can go back east to the bedroom. And it, it, during training, what we saw that it had a really, really strong bias towards going east, because the probability is close to one. And it goes close to one pretty quickly. And that's because it doesn't know where it is anymore, basically. It just, it just thinks the two states of going west are the same, so you know, it should just go east again, because that's what it did the first time after going west. And so th this caused the failures, the failure cases in the table. And so that, that sh it's, it's a bit harder to explain, but it basically shows that state aliasing also happens in dialogue, and it happens uh, when you have the same sentence repeating, repeated in the dialogue. And so uh, we wanted to move towards maximum likelihood to see if that problem happens there as well. So we created a data set with basically the same layout. We just changed the, the colors of the keys. We added the shelf and we changed the material. So we kind of played around with different values of entities and we uh, generated 2,000 game trajectories for training, 1,000 for validation, and 1,000 for test. And then we had also, we had 10 different quests. Uh, the longest quest was the one that I showed before and all the other quests kind of overlapped. And then we trained the same model and we trained another model that's uh, very similar but has an attention mechanism on top of it because we wanted to see if attention kind of helped with state aliasing. And so here I'm showing uh, some results for the model without attention and with attention. So this is the entire trajectory that the, the agent should take. And uh, I'm showing all the states, basically, that the LSCM reads. And what we saw was that those two states here, going west and going east, uh, the, if you look at the distance uh, in hidden space, this distance was very, very low compared to the distance to uh, the other states. And so that kind of... Um, suggested aliasing as well. And in this case, it's a bit different, but it's because if you look at the other, at the, uh, the next actions, it's unlocking the chest, opening the chest in both cases. So these two states, going east and going west, are followed by the same sequence of actions right after. Not exactly the same, but the, it's, the sequence starts similar. Unlock, open, unlock, open. And what we saw is that this induced this state aliasing. And then what was interesting is that if you look at the last action, insert shampoo into the chest, whenever we gave the possibility to the agent to go east at this state, it chose to go east, which is exactly what happened in RL, and which was due to the state aliasing as well. So it, it, the, the models also suffered very, very much from state aliasing and maximum likelihood. And so we wanted to look for uh, ways to overcome this problem. And, and if you remember in the RL experiments, uh, what was suggested was that exploration helped and also having a baseline, which is basically estimating the rewards. In MLE, we can't do exploration because we only work from a fixed data set, so there's no way to explore. We just need to work with those trajectories that we have. So the question is, was can we extract rewards from the training data and then force our model to um, to predict those rewards on top of predict, predicting the next action? And the answer is yes. So we proposed a, a solution with inverse reinforcement learning, and we just submitted it to EMNLP. So um, I can't, the, the paper is not online yet because there's an, an anonymity period with EMNLP, but uh, if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about it or, or share the paper with you privately. Um, and just to conclude, the, the takeaways from this talk is state aliasing is a problem for RNNs uh, trained with MLEs and with MLE and policy gradients. And this problem occurs in dialogue as well because in dialogue you have many times the same response given to different contexts. And uh, what seems to help in RL is exploration and having uh, baseline est estimation in MLE. We propose a solution inspired uh, from inverse reinforcement learning that helps. We have very promising results that I'm happy to talk about offline. And so to kind of really quickly loop back to visual dialogue, um, I don't know if you've ever trained a uh, model for visual dialogue, but you get this kind of devastating experience where the model just repeats itself all the time. Like this is an example, is it a person? No. 
So if you ask, is it a person, and somebody answers no, you won't ask again because you're trying to guess the object, you're trying to move on. So this is never in the training data. But this is what the model does. It keeps repeating itself over and over again. And so our working hypothesis right now is that this is probably due to state aliasing to some effect. And uh, we're, so we're running further experiments to try to um, address this in visual dialogue as well. But this is, I think, applicable to any kind of dialogue modeling task. And um, yeah, so I'm going to stop it here. So thank you for your attention. And again, if you're interested in, in reading the paper, I can share it. Just send me an email and happy to take any question. We can take one quick question. That's a great question. Uh, this is something that I've been thinking about that I haven't, uh, I haven't had time to run experiments in, in that case in particular. I think that could be due to state aliasing again, but it's really hard to uh, just analyze this phenomenon precisely because then it, it could happen in the decoder, it could happen in the encoder. You, it's really hard to just isolate where it happens exactly, but I think it could be due to that. And in general, I think repetition is a problem in the representations and the, the yeah, the learned representations. So I think it could be due to that. Uh, but yeah, it's just really hard to isolate and just look at this in particular. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.